So, uh, welcome to everybody at our AIDA Excellence um, Lectures. Uh, I see that participants are arriving, uh, but uh, without losing too much time, I will give you words for the introduction. So I'm very happy to introduce to you Professor Ioannis Patras. He is now a professor of computer vision and human sensing in Queen Mary University of London, also a director of research graduate studies there. Uh, you can see at the web page of um, AIDA talks uh, his uh, short bio, but just as you could suspect, he obtained the first degrees from Greece, University of Crete, then from Delft, University of Technology, and also worked at the University of Amsterdam, University of York. His main research interests are in computer vision and machine learning methods. Today talk is um, concerning quite important topic in deep uh, neural networks applied also the images. So we have generative models, controllable generation and learning. That's all. The floor is yours, Ioannis. And as usual, a short message, you can prepare your question either in the chat or at the end, you can ask them directly. Please, Ioannis, could you start? Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, and uh, please uh, feel free, so far as I am concerned, to ask any questions uh, during the presentation uh, as well. So I am indeed a professor in computer vision in uh, Queen Mary University of London. And today I'm going to be talking about uh, generative models, about uh, controllable image generation and about learning. Uh, this is not what I'm uh, mostly known uh, for, if uh, uh, I have a clear idea about that. Uh, the main work uh, that uh, I have been uh, doing is uh, in with my group is in an area that can be characterized as looking at or sensing people. So we are using, uh, in general, computer vision, machine learning, and pattern recognition methodologies in order to analyze mainly uh, images and image sequences that depict people and their activity. So we are uh, working on facial expression analysis, uh, recognizing uh, uh, facial uh, movements, and linking them to affect, so to emotions, uh, to mental and uh, mental health issues and cognitive states. We are analyzing images that depict people and their activities, so it's to recognize what they are doing, to localize them, to recognize their pose, uh, etc. So only recently we have been working on generative models for both uh, generation and for uh, learning. Uh, why are we doing that? And what is actually controllable image generation and why I'm interested in that uh, is uh, summarized in this uh, slide here. So controllable image generation is generation of fake images of artificial images, synthetic images, like the ones here on the left-hand side. All of those are not real images. Such persons do not exist. Uh, and by saying controllable, it means that we can control the content. We can control the attributes. In the case of facial images, we can control attributes such as facial expression. We can control uh, the gender. We can control the length of the hair. We can control the color of the hair, the skin color, the facial expressions, uh, everything. Now, why are we interested in that? First of all, uh, controllable generation can be an end goal by itself. For example, for creative industries uh, that generate uh, images in the background or they want to generate uh, uh, photorealistic uh, characters. However, what my uh, interest is come on the role that such synthetic images can play in the analysis side. Let's take a motion recognition as affect recognition as an example. Uh, and uh, the dominant uh, machine learning framework, which is a supervised learning uh, paradigm in this uh, domain. So there, uh, the, uh, an example of uh, uh, what you might want to do for emotion recognition is to design a neural network that takes as input an image and gives in the output uh, an estimation about the affect, about the emotions of the people that are depicted in it. How do you train such a network? You have pairs of uh, images. You have pairs of images. 
such as this, and labels, annotations of the emotions of the people that are depicted in it. Now, finding large scale data sets that are labeled, that are annotated is very hard because manual annotation is a labor intensive process. And it is also noisy. The labels that you produce can be noisy, can be uncertain. Also the data sets uh, are, uh, there are issues with the data sets. They can be, uh, they're not uh, usually public because there are privacy constraints, because there are copyright issues. If you have ways of generating images in a synthetic images in the controllable manner, you can have potentially unlimited number of data. You do not have privacy issues. You do not have copyright issues. Uh, and I will try to motivate, I will try to say some of the applications uh, later, once I describe a, a little bit more in detail the models and, that, uh, and what they can uh, do. So I have structured the talk like that. I'm going to present three main uh, uh, works that uh, are taking place in my group. Um, the first one is on controllable image generation um, in an unsupervised uh, manner. The idea is to learn to generate synthetic images such that we control certain properties such as, as I say, facial expressions or um, such for uh, length of uh, hair. Uh, we find those, uh, this is by using pre -trained, uh, a pre-trained gun, finding paths in this, uh, in the Latin space of those uh, uh, guns, and we find these paths in a completely unsupervised uh, manner. So uh, the generation now, the paths uh, that control the generation are learned in an unsupervised manner. In the second work, that is also a recent work now, is these paths are controlled using natural language. The idea now is that you define in a natural language sentences, contrasting sentences, and starting from a synthetic image, you can add, uh, for example, you can traverse a path that goes from a picture of a shaved man into a picture of a man with a beard. So starting from um, an arbitrary synthetic image, you can add facial hair or you can remove facial hair. Uh, and the last part is on learning parts and appearances. So working with synthetic images, such as such that you can localize um, uh, different semantic parts and their appearances in ways that can allow you localize um, uh, concepts such as the dog or the background. And it allows you to change the appearance of the eyes of the cat, for example. I'm going to get into the first uh, methodology. This is work with uh, Zalepis and uh, uh, Jemiropoulos that happened, but uh, is published in ICCV 2021. The main idea is to work with a pre-trained gun generator and find paths in the Latin space of the gun generator, such so that following um, uh, the Latin codes along a certain path control a certain attribute such as a smile, following another path, uh, controls another attribute such as the hair uh, style. I will very briefly, I'm talking, I'm saying that uh, we are working with pre-trained gun generators. So I will very briefly describe what the gun generator is. A generator is a uh, neural network basically that takes in the input a vector of numbers, D numbers, D dimensional vector, and uh, after some uh, convolution operations, it produces in the output an image. Now the goal is to train the weights of the generator such, as, such that the image that is generated in the output, it is indistinguishable from a collection of training images that you have at your disposal. How it is trained? You use a discriminator now, which is another network that it is trained in an adversarial manner competing with a generator. The discriminator is staying what in, the, uh, in the input. Huh? Um, I don't... If we can mute them, somebody is talking. If we can mute them, that would be great. Um, so we have the discriminator that takes an input, an image in the input, and it tries to detect whether it is a real image or whether it has been generated by the uh, generator. Now, the idea is that these two networks are trained uh, in competition, uh, such that when the discriminator cannot tell the difference between the images that the generator 
uh, generates and the real ones. The idea is that at that point, the generator will, have gen will be generating reliable um, uh, photorealistic uh, images. Now that's the uh, main idea about uh, generative adversarial networks. Uh, so starting from uh, a latent code, starting from a, this d-dimensional vector, you will generate an image with another uh, latent code, with another uh, vector, d-dimensional vector, you will generate another image. Now the question that we try to address is as follows. Can we find paths in this latent space such that if we follow the red path, then we will get latent codes that will control a certain property such as uh, the pose. And if we follow another path, we will control another property such as a facial expression. The answer is yes. <laughs> and um, this is the way that we do it. Uh, the main idea now here is that we propose a parameterization now of those paths using so-called radial basis functions. Uh, the talk will become a little bit technical. Uh, These radial basis functions have a parameter sigma that control the centers of the radial uh, kernels and gamma, which control the scale of the radial uh, uh, of, the, of these radial basis functions. Now, um, a set of those radial basis uh, functions describe um, a warping function f, okay, uh, the gradient of which can be obtained in a closed form. Uh, once we can take the gradient in a closed form, then at each position, at each point in the latent space, we have a vector, and therefore we can define this warping function and we can follow paths by following those vectors uh, uh, that are the uh, gradient. If we have k different warping functions, we have k different ways of finding paths. The idea is, can we learn the parameters of k different functions such that following paths along uh, one of the warping functions will control an attribute such as facial expression and following paths along the other parameter along the other uh, warping function will uh, change another attribute such as um, head pose. Uh, this parameterization is quite interesting because as a special, because uh, by controlling this parameter gamma and by controlling this sigma, then we can have different degrees of nonlinearity. Uh, we can go from a very nonlinear case uh, into uh, linear cases and linear cases is what some uh, other people in the literature uh, have done before us. Now, uh, the question is now, with the parameterization that we have, um, um, we need to find now the uh, parameters of those k different functions such that walking along a certain function, uh, along a certain uh, warping function, as I say, uh, will generate, will control a certain uh, attribute such as head pose along another, if we walk along another path, we will generate latent codes that will control another attribute such as facial expression. How do we train this warping network now that it generates these different paths? The answer is that we use another network that is called the reconstructor uh, here. And it takes as input pairs of images. These pairs of images are a pair of images is generated following along a certain path. And the role of reconstruct, reconstructor is when it's giving, when it's getting as input two images, a pair of images, the role of the reconstruction is to recognize which warping function, which path generated this, um, uh, these uh, images. Now, the reconstructor is trained in collaboration with the warping network, such that the warping network is trying to generate um, uh, paths such that walking along a certain path creates differences that are different than the differences that are created if you follow another path. Following a certain path, would and, um, uh, so that it makes the job of the reconstructor uh, easier. Uh, 
And by doing uh, that, then it leads to paths that control different, uh, that are visually, that control visually different uh, changes. And in the end, leads to, to paths that control different visual uh, attributes. This is something that we verify in uh, different, many different uh, guns uh, and the results and with many different uh, generators. And some of the results are shown uh, here. Um, we have found paths that starting from the images on uh, in the middle, control attributes such as the skin color or the naturalness of the generated images. In the case of dogs that control factors such as zoom or remove bark that can remove the background or attributes such as the uh, pose of the dog. These are results that we can have in case in the domain of facial expression. So following certain path, it can add uh, hair, it can control the rotation, it can control the facial expressions. Uh, and something that we want also in this domain is that when following a certain path, we control only a single uh, property. So we generate paths that are as much as disentangled as possible from each other. Uh, do we achieve to do that? The answer is yes. Um, and do we quantify now this in this experiment, in this uh, table that uh, I am showing to you here? Uh, this experiment, what it does is that it tries to quantify um, the changes in certain attributes such as yo, uh, pitch, smile, race, or hair that are generated when following different paths that we discover. And we see that we have paths that correspond to generated changes only for yo and very low changes and change very little all the other attributes. Another path seems to be dedicated to uh, making changes on the pitch. Uh, another path that is dedicated to make changes on smiles, etc., etc. So we have large numbers along the diagonal, small numbers um, outside the diagonal. And that means that the uh, uh, paths that we generate are as disentangled as uh, possible. So this was the first work that I wanted to present. The second work is uh, again with uh, Zalapis, with Old Firdle and Zimir, Zimiropoulos. This is work under um, uh, a review. Uh, and in this specific uh, uh, work, we are trying now to find uh, paths in the latent space of guns. Uh, again, following a certain path will generate uh, changes according to certain properties, okay? Now, these properties are controlled with natural uh, language. Um, for example, we want to go from a picture of a shaved man uh, to a picture of a man with a beard. We're finding paths now in the Latin space of guns that generate changes according to those two contrasting sentences. How we do that is summarized in this uh, slide um, uh, here. So we start with an um, large uh, a visual and image language model called CLIP um, by OpenAI. Uh, basically, this uh, CLIP has an image and a text encoder. And uh, the idea is that it embeds text uh, and images into the same Latin space. So it takes uh, text, gets it through a uh, text encoder, and generate a 512 dimensional vector, has uh, takes an image in the input uh, via the image encoder. Again, it embeds it in the same space. If the image and the text content are the same or similar, then those vectors should be as similar as possible. So how do we utilize now this um, pre-trained uh, clip? What we do is that we define pairs of contrasting sentences uh, such as those, a picture of a shaved man and a picture of a man with a beard. And another contrasting sentence is a picture of a sad person and a picture of a happy person. We embed those sentences, those contrasting sentences, 
uh, using the clip uh, text encoder, and those defined points in the joint image language uh, space. Uh, having those points, these are the poles, these are poles, and then uh, by doing that, then we can define paths now between those uh, poles. Now, the idea is to train a warping network, and the warping network is, to, sorry, to find paths now in the latent space of GANs, such that images that are generated along a certain path are encoded through the uh, clip image encoder along paths that coincide, that are as similar as possible to paths that correspond to the uh, language uh, contrasting sentences that we are interested um, in. Um, that is the main idea and we use an appropriate clause such that the uh, uh, so that pairs of images that are generated along a certain path um, are uh, creating a vector of, uh, in the Latin space that it is aligned with a certain path that is this, that it is uh, defined by the contrasting uh, sentences. I'm not going to go into the details of the type of the loss. If uh, you want, I will elaborate that. Uh, during uh, questions. What I want to say now here is that um, actually, uh, basically what we do is that we do not use such uh, uh, simple uh, sentences. You usually use large contrasting sentences such as, for example, from going from sadness to happiness, we use a, an extensive uh, sentence describing how sad face look uh, like. Uh, we create sub-sentences. Each sub-sentence is uh, projected using the text encoder into a specific point into the Latin space. Uh, and all of those uh, sentences um, create a region now in this Latin space. Now the paths that we uh, generate take into consideration now the complexity of the concept that it is described in the uh, uh, sentence in the natural language uh, uh, sentence. For more details, you can look at a paper. It is um, uh, called Contract Clip. It is also it is in the archive. Now here I will show you some of the results that we obtain using this methodology. Uh, <clears throat> and these are images uh, that are so we start from the image. In all cases, we start from an image from the image in the middle, and um, we generate images that are supposed to. Uh, traverse along concepts that are defined with this con with the contrastive sentences that are at the bottom uh, that are at the caption. So starting from a photo of cat, then we can generate. Then we can go from an ugly. Can make we can uglify it, or we can make it uh, uh, cuter. Uh, the same thing with a dog. We can make it an aggressive or a friendly one. Uh, in the case of a car, we can go from a city car or a sports car. Um, training is very, very fast. And uh, as we say, this uh, by using natural language uh, supervision allow us basically to uh, have a large number of uh, paths, a large number of concepts, as many as we uh, uh, want. So uh, this is in the domain of facial expression. It shows also some of the limitations as well. So we can see here at the bottom, uh, traversals um, or starting from the face in the middle, then we can make it uh, happier or we can make it angrier. This works very well in the case that the emotions are contrasting, so the sentences are truly contrasting. In the case that they are not as contrasting, so going from an angry face to a surprise, then uh, the result is not uh, as uh, uh, good. Uh, and here we can see more results now. Of, uh, so here we can see that we can reconstruct very nicely, take this person, uh, preserving very well the identity, we can uh, make it uh, happier or uh, not. Uh, we can work also with much more, uh, which very uh, complex uh, concept, a little bit complex, more complex uh, concepts. Um, here, starting again from, and we compare with uh, methods in the literature. Uh, the bottom row is uh, 
changes that uh, style clip is uh, creating using the same um, a language uh, contrast uh, con uh, uh, constructs and we can see that we are quite uh, better in starting from an image and making the man uh, cry and with a beard or uh, removing hair and uh, making them uh, angrier than what the other methods in the literature uh, are uh, doing. Uh, this was the second work that I wanted to present. And now the third and the last work is about learning. And uh, this is work that will be presented in ICLR in 2023, joint work with Zelepis uh, uh, again, with all the field of Panagaikas and Nicolaou from uh, the National uh, Kapodistian University of Athens and the Cyprus uh, Institute. The goal here is a little bit different. It is, not control it is uh, on controllable image generation, but um, um, we do that in the following way. Now, the idea now is to find uh, la latent representations of images, semantic parts and uh, appearances. So to work on synthetic images, on the latent representations of synthetic images, such that uh, we can localize semantic concepts, for example, like the ears of the cat or the eyes of the cat, in ways that uh, will end uh, their appearances, in ways that will allow us to locally, to perform local uh, editing, and in ways that will allow us to localize concepts such as, for example, the background or uh, the dog. Here I have some examples also of the edits that we are able to perform. We can remove objects, we can remove certain parts, or we can change the appearance of different parts. For example, add windows in this building. Now this goes beyond the state uh, of the art, beyond other methods in the literature, including the work that I have presented um, uh, before, the other work with Tselepis and Zemiropoulos. Uh, those works usually, what they do is that they find paths in the Latin space of guns. However, those paths that they find control uh, affect the whole Latin code. And there is no way that they, uh, or that we explicitly control the changes to take place in specific regions in the image. There are some works that try to overcome that. However, they are usually quite complicated uh, I'm not going to go into the details, but if you want to ask me afterwards, then uh, I can describe what are the uh, differences with methods in the literature. So how we do that? Um, the method that we propose work on convolutional um, generators. Convolutional generators are described here at the bottom of, the, uh, of this uh, image. Start with a Latin code, so this d-dimensional vector. Uh, perform convolutions in the output they give an image, synthetic image. But intermediate, the intermediate representation, they have those feature maps that they have special dimensions, so they have width and height, and they have channel dimension. The channel dimensions, the vector at the specific location, controls the appearance at that specific location. Now, the main idea here is that we propose a uh, decomposition, uh, the following decomposition, the decomposition that it is at the top. What we propose is we say that these intermediate feature maps of fake images are a linear combination now of those bilinear decompositions. And this bilinear decomposition means that each of those images is a linear combination of the outer product of parts, which are this kind of maps here, this is a certain part, and uh, an appearance uh, vector that controls the appearance of that appears, so how this region looks like in the uh, fake image. So you have a linear combination of the other products of parts and appearances. And what you want to find uh, now is uh, parts and appearances that are shared among all uh, fake images uh, and the specific instantiation, the specific linear combination. So those coefficients lambda are specific for the image in question. 
these are the maths. Oops. These are the maths. Uh, we assume that the intermediate feature map, uh, this uh, tensor uh, Z now, can be expressed in this manner. In a vector form, in sorry, in a, a matrix form, it can be expressed as the uh, bilinear combination of those appearance vectors and parts vectors and lambdas here with coefficients, this linear combination, this bilinear combination is with coefficients that are specific for the image in a question. Okay. Uh, after training, after learning, we will learn those appearances, as I say, and parts that are shared between all the image uh, collection. Uh, this leads to an uh, optimization uh, problem. Actually, we formulate the following optimization problem that it is here. Uh, it is expressed in this equation and it is a reconstruction uh, objective. Basically, this can be seen as an uh, encoding decoding scheme in which we find, try to find now the matrices alpha and P, so the matrices of the appearances and the parts, such that in the, co in the encoding phase, you find by using this projection, alpha t, alpha transpose z p, you find the coefficients now of the specific uh, sample. And in the decoding phase, by multiplying left-hand side with alpha and right-hand side with the transpose of p, you reconstruct the original, uh, uh, you reconstruct the uh, feature uh, map. Um, we use, we use two uh, constraints. One constraint is uh, a non-negativity constraint on the on P on the parts. This is explicit. This is a constraint optimization problem. You said that the coefficients of P here should be uh, larger than zero. Uh, this non-negativity leads to sparse parts that correspond that are well actually also well localized. And uh, we can see that in the bottom uh, row in this uh, figure here, uh, these are the parts, these are the P's that uh, are produced if the non-negativity constraints are enforced. You can see that they're very well localized. Uh, in the case that non-negativity constraints are not imposed, then you can see that the coefficients are uh, blurred or shared in very different areas in the image. This is a result that is very well known from uh, non uh, with uh, using non-negative constraints uh, uh, in comparison to other decompositions such as PCA, for example, that do not use this uh, constraint. And the other constraint is that we use orthogonality on the, the parts and the appearances. This is implicit and it comes from the reconstruction. I'm happy to take questions on that if um, uh, you're interested in uh, later. Now, after training. May we ask a question? Can, uh -huh. can we ask a go question? Ahead. Yes, go ahead. <clears throat> where, where, is, where, where do you place, in fact, this analysis in the process of generating the image? Uh, how you determine which is the, the, the best um, depth, in fact, in the uh, generation process? where to place these probes. Yeah, um, so we do that in, this is a, a very much a, a empirical. Uh, some of the things we know from other methods in the literature, um, and we know, for example, that uh, later, earlier layers control uh, yeah. large uh, uh, concepts and uh, in the later stages, in the later stages, the later layers, Control mm, uh, small mm. textures, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So these are, uh, but uh, uh, we find some paths. Uh, sorry, we find some factors uh, at different layers, and then in an uh, empirical manner, we determine which parts we are interested. Because it could be it could be interesting to have some kind of a control controllability uh, uh, parameters that estimates mm. what what is the uh, the best. For, for given properties, in fact, what is the best representation to prove? Yes, 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 yes. Um, we haven't worked on that, but uh, I'm thinking we of are working, uh, working on this. 
We are working okay. on this for speech synthesis. So I cannot see I who is talking question. though. <laughs> I, I hear a voice, but I don't know who is talking. I'm Jean Bailly. So okay, you can, you can nice. see us my face. Great, okay. great, great, great. Uh, happy to take this offline, uh, and if you're interested to to look into this. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Okay. So where was I? So yeah. So what I was saying that is that after training, then we find parts and appearances, uh, depending, of course, on which uh, tensors we choose, then we end up with different parts and with different appearances. And once we have the parts and the appearances, then what we can do is uh, edit an image in the way that locally, in the way that we want. How do we do that? So uh, a latent code generate a fake image. Now uh, we have the decompositions into parts and appearances. So if we want now to add the appearance J at a specific part uh, K, uh, then we pick up the part K then and then we add the appearance that we are interested in. Uh, in the uh, feature in the intermediate feature uh, map. This alpha j will make, the, uh, and again, this is a thing that we are manually doing. We're picking up the appearance that we are interested in, but we can see that if we can put some uh, one uh, certain appearance vector, then it can change the color uh, of the uh, eyes. And we have other properties that we can control as well. Um, we see that because we change only locally the feature map, then we are changing only locally the appearance. And we can quantify that by seeing the difference between the edited image and the original image. This is the mean square error. We see that only areas around the eyes are uh, changed. Uh, this is a quantization of, uh, uh, sorry, a quantification of uh, what I have just described and in comparison to other uh, methods in the literature. Uh, I'm not going to stay into that. Um, what I'm saying and to what is um, clear is that we are able to do local changes uh, by contrast to other methods in the literature that can, that the changes that they generate are global in nature, more global in uh, nature. Um, and uh, I have a little bit of time, okay. So uh, a limitation of what we have proposed is that the parts that uh, we have, uh, that we decompose with are shared along uh, all objects in the uh, data set. That means that well, the implicit assumption is that the part that corresponds to the eyes, for example, on all images are on roughly the same location, which means that images should be aligned. This is a hard constraint. This is not a realistic constraint. We relax this constraint by uh, allowing the parts to deviate from the global uh, parts so that we have uh, for specific images, parts that can be uh, uh, parts maps could be uh, um, individual. So that could uh, deviate a little bit, could deviate, not a little bit, they could deviate from the uh, global part. This allows, these uh, are the uh, maps, the parts that we arrive to if we use only if we use uh, parts that are shared along all images in the data set. So you can see a lot of blurring, for example, because images on the data sets with cars contain cars that are at different positions. And in the case that we allow uh, individual images to have uh, their own parts, we, you see that we have much better uh, localization of the different parts. Um, here we, hear, we see some examples of local uh, image uh, editing. Uh, this is the original image. Um, we can add a certain appearance, uh, the appearance A1 in the part six. This is the part six. Appearance one is a certain appearance vector. Uh, by doing adding the appearance vector one, we can remove, uh, we can add basically the background and to remove therefore the tower. Uh, we can adding the uh, appearance tree at part one to this part here, then we can add uh, trees. Uh, we can add clouds in the sky. We can add windows on the main 
building. All of these edits are local, very local in nature, and the rest of the image is largely unchanged. Uh, something very interesting is that we can find in all of the guns is uh, in all of the uh, generators that we have seen, we have found uh, something that can correspond to the background concept. If we have the background concept, then basically we can remove images in the background. And you can see some examples in those images uh, here. We can remove the bird, for example. We can remove the uh, tower here or the other uh, tower uh, there. Uh, we can localize concepts. I'm not going to stay very much into that. And I will come to the conclusion to say that basically what we have is a, a methodology in which we can do local editing and we can localize uh, parts. Uh, code is available online and uh, a presentation will come in ICLR in uh, May. So after I have shown you know what we can do, what we can, what these methodologies can do, I will try to motivate a little bit in a couple of slides now some of the applications. Um, so one, if we can generate images in an um, in a controllable manner, then we can do something that it is quite important, especially in the domain of mental health that it is of very much interest to me. So we can generate. Uh, data sets that are as close as possible to, um, sorry, we can generate synthetic data sets in which the images that are contained there are, uh, 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 are as close as possible to the images in the original uh, data set, but do not have copyright or uh, uh, privacy uh, issues. This is, of course, very important in the mental health. You don't want to reveal the identity of the people that are, um, uh, have, for example, some mental health conditions. This is a paper that uh, is going to be, actually, it was accepted yesterday. It's going to be presented in CVPR in 2023. Uh, the idea is that we start with an image and then we control, we generate an artificial image that has all the properties or as many properties um, uh, as close as possible to the properties of the original image, except of the identity. Um, the paper will come very uh, out very soon. Uh, you can have a look at it. What is important here, what I wanted to say is the application. Uh, another application, oops, yes. Uh, and another application, if you have controllable image generation, is on providing more robust and more fair um, building more robust and more fair uh, machine learning methodologies. How? Well, we know that in certain data sets, you have underrepresented classes or underrepresented um, uh, properties. For example, um, certain skin color or certain uh, genders might be underrepresented in certain data sets. Well, if you can keep all attributes the same except of gender or skin color, then you can augment the underrepresented uh, the underrepresented classes. And that will allow you to generate sample that will allow you to build fairer and more robust machine learning uh, models. Um, I highlight here an area that I think that it is very, very interested and in. this is on uh, recent models, on diffusion models or general models that go from text to uh, image. I'm not going to stay uh, a lot into that because I'm out of uh, time, but uh, uh, I think that this is an area that it is um, very interesting and uh, very important. And this is where my group is um, uh, focusing on uh, at the moment. Um, I would like also to bring attention now to one special issue that we have in the ACM transaction of uh, uh, multimedia, uh, computing communication and applications. Um, and by following this link, uh, we have a deadline in uh, a month from now, uh, and it is on uh, realistic synthetic data, and we're covering topics from generation, from learning, and evaluation. Uh, that was all from uh, me. Thank you very much. I would be very glad to answer any question you have. Um, thank you uh, very much for your inspiring, very interesting talk. And uh, now we are opening discussion. 
which could be done both by the chat and also as Gerard uh, by switching on a microphone and asking a question directly. Mm -hmm. Perhaps I will start uh, uh, from reading the chat. Mm -hmm. uh, Amit Zurich asked a question, mm -hmm. how does your work relate to similar methods operating on other models, such as toggling the latent space variables in beta variational autoencoders. Uh, let me see. Uh, I'm reading as well. So how does your work relate to similar methods? Uh, I guess that we are talking about the last uh, uh, the last work, this ICLR work, uh, toggling the latent space variables in uh, variational uh, in variation in variational autoencoders. Uh, um, so the works that uh, um, I am, uh, I think that the best would be to, to take that we take this with uh, uh, Oldfield, who is uh, actually the primary author of the paper. Um, um, we are able also to do. We're not toggling. I, mean, uh, I suppose that you mean that you're changing now the latent uh, uh, the. Uh, you're changing now the uh, channel vectors at specific locations in the uh, feature maps. Is this what you're talking about? Search inside the notes and captions. Sorry, say that again. Video learning made easy. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Video learning made easy. Uh, could you repeat once again your comment? Because I was also unable to uh, understand the question like Yanis. Uh, sorry, I think that uh, the person that switched on the microphone before wasn't really the one making the question, which was I. Yes. Uh, specifically, uh, <clears throat> if you train like variational encoders or uh, beta variational encoders usually what you can observe is that the latent variables that you uh, use to generate the image mm -hmm. have some uh, semantic uh, meaning and mm -hmm. you can discover that these variables are related to specific traits for example if we talk about faces uh, some uh, variables that are captured by the variational encoders might be, for example, uh, shape or color of the eyes, etc. Uh, mm -hmm. I wanted to know if it is possible, if, if you have done some uh, studies relating the effectiveness of uh, like variating these uh, variables inside variational encoders with the uh, your method that you have uh, proposed for uh, navigating the latent space of guns. Yeah. So you mean on the previous, on the on the first, uh, the first yeah, methodology. Yeah. The, the first work yes. specifically. Yes. 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 Uh, I'm not sure with which specific methods on autoencoders we have compared, but at that point we did compare with other methods. Uh, we did compare with other methods uh, in the literature. Uh, indeed, uh, what you're saying is correct, uh, that uh, the way that the autoencoders are uh, constructed and uh, because they are trying to find diagonal uh, matrices uh, in the latent uh, space so that the correlations between the different uh, dimensions of the latent vector are uh, uh, low, uh, try to find disentangled um, 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 uh, dimensions. So we have to, there are two issues now with the vari especially with specifically with the variational autoencoders. One was uh, I believe that uh, or certainly at the moment at the time that we wrote the paper, uh, the quality of the images that were generating uh, was not as good as um, guns. That was that's the first uh, um, uh, observation, and the second is that. Uh, uh, and the second is that uh, the uh, disentanglement between the different uh, dimensions was not as high as the ones that we observed with uh, the criterion that we have imposed. Um, Christos is also here, maybe he can comment on that, uh, but um, that is my uh, short answer. Yeah, basically that's the, that's the, that's the answer because uh, variational encoders 
are basically trained to be disentangled in a way. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, while in our case, what we try to do is to use a pre-trained gun and try to impose disentanglement in that. So this, uh, this is the first difference. And the other one, as Yannis said, is that uh, the quality of uh, the uh, generated images in various knowledge encoder, I think, uh, uh, is very, very far from uh, those uh, uh, achieved by guns, specifically the most modern ones, style guns. Uh, so various knowledge encoders, beta via specifically, uh, in the best of my knowledge, uh, has been evaluated only on toy data sets, not on high resolution images like. Uh, uh FFHQ and the like. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much for answering this question. I see that among the users, Luis Esprito is uh, giving a sign that he wants to ask a question. So please switch on a microphone, Louis, and ask a question. Hello. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, I would like to ask you some questions about the first uh, part, like the, um, yes, so... The latent, uh, non-linear... Uh, yes, non-linear and... latent um, code exploration. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes, so one of the, yeah, the first question I have is that, so you said you, you have like a reconstruction of the path um, and I don't really understood what mm. you mean by that. Uh, how do you reconstruct the path? Um, and so, what is the loss in that case? And how do you optimize those parameters of the wrapping when you're reconstructing the path? And, okay. Yeah. okay. Uh, let me see. You can see what. Uh, yes, yes. You can, you can see where I am now, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, so the main idea is this, that uh, um, actually I'm not sure that the reconstructor is the best name. Um, so the main idea now is that we, you have a network here mm-hmm. that takes as input a pair of images. Yes. And it tries to find the index of the path that generated those pair of images. Okay. So, it tries to find out whether this pair of images has been, uh, whether a pair of images has been generated by this path or by this path. Now, okay. uh, if the reconstructor, if uh, uh, the warping network now is trying to generate paths, pairs of paths or dif- different paths, so as to make the the, job of the reconstructor it's called the reconstructor mm-hmm. uh, the judge to make it easy what does okay, it so mean to make it easy it me- sorry mm-hmm. uh, so sorry uh so let me just um uh, see if i got it it's almost mm-hmm. like a multi-class classification problem where you're classifying the two pairs of images into one path or one transformation one wrapping okay yes. So it is a multi-class, it's exactly that. Maybe I should have said that. It is a, a, a multi-class classification problem. It takes okay. a pair of images in the input and in the output it gives an index from one to K. Mm-hmm. That, that is it, that, that, that's it. Okay, now, and uh, so how do you train the, or how do you do, I don't know if, what kind of optimization we, are you so doing? So we have a cross entropy loss which uh-huh. is a classification problem. So we have a cross entropy loss, uh, which could be in a uh, contrastive loss. It doesn't matter so much. Mm-hmm. I'm, yes. I'm not actually sure, I think, but, but I think that it is a contrast, that is, sorry, that it is a cross entropy loss. Uh, and the uh, intuitively now, uh, the reconstruct, the, this network here, the judge here, the reconstructor would have an easy job if this pair of images would be very mm-hmm. different than this pair of images. Mm-hmm. So, uh, if this uh, change uh, an attribute that it is very different from this attri- from the attribute that changes in this pair of images, then the reconstructor would have an easy job. Yes, but what I'm asking is that, is that reconstructor tra- pre-trained in some way 
or no, no, is, are, no. so they are both the network or the optimism the, the warp, warping networks and reconstructors are both being optimized at the same time exactly yes okay. they are they are with the same uh, objective yeah. so the gradients okay. uh, flow from here from this pair of images to the, from during training of the reconstructor the gradients flow up to here yes uh, in yeah. the case of the warping network the gradients flow from all the way from here to, to here to back there okay perfect yeah. And uh, another question, but it's it's about the next slide. I think it's about the evaluation of mm -hmm. the same uh, experience. This yes, one? yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Um, so I have one question that is, uh, how did you measure the your pitch smile raise um, of those? Yeah. Which baseline did you use to, to measure those? And uh, what does the R angle? means in this table because i'm not actually i'm not very familiarized with this uh this area so yes so uh we use some pre-trained uh, uh detectors some pre-trained uh, estimators so mm -hmm. we have in some other data sets we have a ground truth of yo pitch smile and um, hair length etc etc so we have uh, uh detectors that given an image that give uh, and uh, value of whether the hair is long, for example, okay, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. or about the yo. So now what we have is that we have images that are generated. Sorry, we have uh, paths, okay? Yes. So now we want to see this path here. These paths are learned in a completely unsupervised manner. So we have a K, we have a one, two, three, four, five paths, yes. but we don't know. This uh, mm -hmm. to which properties they uh, correspond. They correspond. So yeah. what we do is that we see uh, if we we start from an image, if we change the image <coughs> following this path, uh, which of those attributes change? How much does it change? And we say that if we follow, if we so yeah, and that we quantify. We see uh, we find that actually this is the correlation between. Mm -hmm. Changes uh, along between, sorry, between uh, the length of the path that we follow and the output of the pre trained detector. These are all pre trained detectors. Mm -hmm. These are paths that we want to see what they are doing. Do they do, do they correspond to some interpretable in some uh, changes in any of those attributes? Okay. Uh, yeah, and the angle, I suppose, it's uh, somehow. Uh, yeah. I think this is related uh, to, to if uh, I, I forgot now what it, what actually is, but I think that it is related to the change to the number of changes. So this is in degrees. Yes. Uh, for the yo degrees for the pitch. Um, the smile is from zero to one. Uh, ah, okay, 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 okay. So it's like a. Much more no, interpretable. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks for the discussion. Perhaps for a moment we will switch to the chat because we have some questions. So George Papanitikas asked you a bit long uh, question. Uh, Let me see it. I think I can say it. Okay, but you can read it. I will be re okay. Re reading Assuming the different fetters generated. Aim to aid in the lack of people representing the skin, hair, and other properties in the data set. That means each photo created with a slight change might create facial characteristics that could belong to a human. And there is a comment that from your presentation up to until now, he spotted a couple of photos that can arguably be a good training data. So his question is, how are you going to filter such uh, suspicious patterns? Yes. So uh, first of all, uh, the good news is that uh, uh, because we haven't solved completely the problem, then we have something to be working on for our next uh, papers. That's uh, the, short, <laughs> the short answer to this. Uh, to this. Uh, what I want to say is this, that uh, uh, the images that we are, uh, uh, for the images that I have generated, and in several of them, I uh, show long uh, changes. I have long, I follow long paths. Um, I'm sorry if I can, uh, I follow long paths so as to exaggerate 
things that I wanted to show. So for example, here I changed the uh, yo by very, very much. And then you see that other characteristic change as well. So if this was used in order to uh, augment the data set with, uh, for example, with yo at the end of the uh, distribution, I, uh, at the end of the changes, this indeed wouldn't be a good uh, training uh, uh, example. Uh, so I agree with that. And the answer is that instead of either you try to filter it out, I don't know exactly how you would filter it out, or you would try to improve the method. Again, I don't know exactly how I would uh, improve the uh, method. Um, these are things that we are working on, and um, I don't have an exact uh, answer to that, I'm afraid. Anyway, thank you very much. We have uh, still some questions in the chat. Uh, I guess the first one is similar to my question. If we come back to the first method about uh, pass, the question is, is it possible to control multiple features in the image at the same time? Sun, mm. skin color, etc. Because uh, you have shown examples with one feature path. Mm. Uh, I'm not sure that we have done this experiment. Um, actually, uh, but uh, no, I'm not sure that we have done this. That we, we haven't done this experiment. In principle, we should be able because. Uh, actually, what we do is that we start with a Latin code, then we generate a path that it creates that changes according to one attribute. Once we have those uh, uh, Latin code, then we can walk along the other path. But uh, I'm not sure that I have seen, uh, maybe Christos uh, has done, uh, uh, has a little bit more uh, uh, experience in that and has tried to generate compound uh, changes. But uh, yeah. Uh, uh, I'm not sure that we have done. Actually, I don't think that we have done that. Chris, yeah, the truth, is, the truth is that we haven't uh, done for the experiments that we report in the paper, but uh, for you know in-house experiments, we have uh, confirmed that there is some kind of uh, commutativity between the paths. Uh, so changing attributes, changing paths uh, at the same time. Uh, yeah, but we haven't reported that in the paper. Okay. okay, I see. It works, but it, we haven't reported it. Good, thanks for the news. There is also a question from Andre Lutzny, a bit mm -hmm. technical. Uh, could the reconstructor, so in your approach, recognize activity also on video, like smiling? Um. um So it should recognize actually, actually, no, we didn't use the, yeah, um, that would be interesting. We didn't, we, we, we didn't do that. Actually, it, it does take as input two uh, images and then it recognizes now uh, uh, changes in those, between those images. So in principle, it, it could work to recognize uh, changes in those attributes or recognize things like uh, this person's hair is longer than the other person's hair or in, the, in this image, the person is smiling more than the other image. Uh, yeah, that's a good suggestion. We didn't think about that, actually. OK, thanks. Uh, I'm not sure, but Gerard, you uh, raised uh, your hand in one moment. Do you want to add something at the end? But please switch on the microphone. OK. So yes, I uh, I much refer to uh, Zhu uh, work on the uh, uh, causal reg regression. He, he used as data uh, indoor scenes from uh, from sleeping room and kitchen and so on. And what I found very interesting is uh, uh, indoor to uh, in, uh, in indoor scene. If you want to increase, in fact, the lightning you have to switch on the lights. So the, idea, the, the, the interesting thing is to be able to connect a large change of, of the image, connected to, uh, to a small, uh, uh, small changes uh, in the picture. So you light the, the lamp and it's uh, uh, somehow increasing the uh, lightning of the scene. 
So this connection between a local change with a global change uh, is, is really, I think, a key feature in the future. Um, so do you have any uh, comment on this? Um, so this idea of causal, causal regression on, on, uh, on this uh, uh, exploration of the embeddings. Mm. Um, I think it is interesting. I mean, I'm not sure how... So the way that we are doing uh, here is that uh, we are saying that we have paths, uh, they should be visible. So I guess that uh, the small quanta of change now that you are uh, referring to is the index of the path that uh, uh, generates now the, uh, that then translates into a path, then translates into an image, and then a small change in the index uh, leads to large changes in the image. Uh, yeah. In general, it is interesting. I guess that there is a lot of uh, many, 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 many works are on those principles, like uh, all the works in which they try to do dimensionality reduction. They're trying to find latent factors that uh, somehow control uh, large the uh, uh, changes in the in the output. Uh, in fact, it's a way exactly. to connect your, your 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 second experiment with the third one. So mm. it's uh, the third one to try to localize, in fact, uh, the uh, to, to be able to really uh, find region of interest that really carries some semantic information, and to connect this with uh, uh, you know uh, uh, exploration of the of the of the whole image. Mm. So uh, yeah, that's that's interesting. Um, that's interesting. And I have a last comment here on, on this slide. OK. Uh, I'm sorry, but uh, uh, because uh, you, you have been asked a question about this. Uh, I think it's very, very like uh, VIE, uh, variational autoencoders, because somehow here you, you, you try to disentangle, in fact, the, 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 uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the latent space between the two the two categories. Yes. It's a way, in fact, uh, to uh, to uh, to include in your paradigm some disentanglement. That is true. That is true. Uh, this is the, the way that we do use the reconstructor uh, uh, here is uh, explicitly to say that yeah. uh, this is the way to disentangle basically the different uh, paths. There are yeah. other ways. Uh, Variation order encoders that try to yeah. uh, say that well, basically to have the covariance matrix to, to have uh, yeah. to be uh, diagonal, which is uh, another way of doing the disentanglement. Which one is better is uh, I, uh, depends a little bit, but we do not have now the this kind of uh, we do not have. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't have. A, it is related, uh, certainly. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. I don't know which one is better. <laughs> okay, uh, thanks very much. Uh, I think we have finished questions and we are also a bit out of time. So I'm closing the discussion. If you have uh, more questions, I guess Ioannis will be happy to receive them offline by Absolutely. email. And uh, I have two, uh, two things at the end. The most important is to say that it was really Nice to hear you and thanks very much, Ioannis, for your very nice lecture. It was really very, very inspiring with all these examples. And I would also add that I would like to thank all participants today for joining us and also for some of you for taking part in our discussion.